Hi everyone, my name is Nick Lambert, I'm the CEO of DOC and welcome to Identity 3, a podcast all about Web3 and digital identity. Uh, today I have the absolute pleasure to be able to introduce one of the OGs from the SSI and, and VC space, uh, Mr. James Monaghan. Thank you for joining us today, James. It's my great pleasure, Nick. Um, so what I normally do is kind of go through, I, I've just obviously taken this off LinkedIn, but kind of just to go through back some of your background, just because in case any of the listeners haven't uh, been familiar with you or any of, of your work to date, um, and I'll probably do it in a bit of a reverse order just to make it a bit interesting. Um, so up until quite recently, you were the VP of product at Evernim, which is again, one of the companies that have been absolutely uh, instrumental in the space for designing a lot of the tools and the concepts um, that are now um, being built out by a number of companies. And you were the VP of product there for, I think, five and a half years. And of course, now you advise a number of companies in the SSI space, including Doc. So a little bit of a disclaimer there for everyone. Um, prior to that, James, you were the VP of carrier products at Telesign. Uh, that was a company that provided two-factor authentication and fraud prevention solutions to, at that time, I think three and a half billion uh, end-user accounts. Um, so really focused on mobile identity. So yeah. um, obviously starting to see some common themes uh, in your work there. You had various roles at MX Telecom. Uh, that was a company kind of involved in mobile messaging, payments, and multimedia content delivery. You're latterly the head of technical projects, but actually started out there um, as a Java developer. So That's you've right. gone right through the full cycle of, of different different roles within a company. Yeah. And then, yeah, so I think the, the common themes, like I say, are, are your kind of product is, is obviously a big one that comes through and obviously identity being one as well. Um, you have a de degree in engineering uh, in electrical and information sciences from Cambridge Uni. So pretty impressive there as well and you're also an ultra marathon runner so we know you like pain as well like like doing hard things yeah that's it yeah exactly yeah yeah but yeah that's yeah so obviously you can see uh, people listening and can see why we'd want you on as a guest because again you've got a ton of experience in the space uh, which we're going to get into now but maybe you could kick us off james um, for audience, audience members who are not aware, who are listening this to, to this, sorry, for maybe the first time, could you give an insight into what self-sovereign identity is and a little bit of how it works, please? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, so self-sovereign identity is basically the idea that individuals should be the people in control of their digital identity. So unlike most of the ways that you're used to uh, interacting online or proving things about yourself where there are third parties or other intermediaries that uh, are vouching for you on your behalf, um, self-sovereign identity uh, tries to tip the balance back towards the individual and actually equip you with the tools to prove what you need to about yourself uh, to have any given interaction. And that would be without the need for any particular intermediaries. You can obviously choose to hire a service provider or use a tool or a wallet or something like that to make that possible. Um, but uh, the, the idea is that that is completely your choice, uh, what tools you use, what you're willing to share, uh, how you're willing to share it, that, those kinds of things. Um, it's probably worth saying that, that self-sovereign identity represents an extreme on a continuum that sort of on, on the other end is, you know, fully central, uh, centralized identity, but sort of just a couple of steps back from self-sovereign identity, you've got, you know, decentralized or portable identity, which um, perhaps de-emphasizes the, the full self-sovereignty uh, of it and, and recognizes that, you know, in many cases, uh, identity interactions, you know, are, are a negotiation and you don't get to be fully self-sovereign if you're governed by the laws of a country or the KYC requirements of a, a financial institution that you want to open an account with and so on and so forth. Um, Whereas, you know, decentralized or portable identity uh, tries to bring many of the same benefits, but just get, really emphasize the, the user control and the reusability aspects, which sort of actually speak to uh, to how to make identity transactions more, more dignified and more convenient. Yeah, great answer, James. So with all of that in mind, what are the main benefits? Why are companies and, and individuals getting so excited about what SSI represents? What are the main advantages as you see them? So I think it's important to say there, there's a number of 
potential benefits. Um, but before we dive into what they are, um, they don't all manifest in every use case. Um, and you know, we, we may we may cover this later. But you know, one of the pitfalls I see is is people trying to put force all of these benefits uh, in every opportunity they get. And you know, it, it is typically only one or two that that really make a difference in a use case. Um, but, but sort of with that with that disclaimer out of the way, um, some of the things that a, a decentralized or self-sovereign approach to identity can give you are uh, portability, authenticity, composability, privacy, control, and interoperability. So there's seven that I, I like to talk about, and we can we can briefly unpack each one. Um, port portability simply speaks to being able to take. Uh, credentials or facets of your identity that you might use over here in domain A and be able to use them in domain B. So just like you could use a driver's license that was issued to you for the purposes of allowing you to operate a motor vehicle, um, and you can use that to prove that you're old enough to buy age-restricted goods, that's a portability use case we're very familiar with in the analog world. Um, decentralized identity lets you do that with digital credentials in the in the digital world. Uh, authenticity speaks to the fact that uh, typically you're dealing with cryptographically signed verifiable credentials. And so those are uh, high definition bits of structured data that contain an electronic signature at the bottom, which means that you can verify the source, integrity and ownership of that credential instantly, no matter where you present it. And so much like the hologram and the photo on a, on a physical credential, um, you have that with this, uh, with this online credential, which is incredibly useful. Um, composability is about being able to not just present the entire credential in one go, like your entire degree certificate or your entire, uh, you know, listening history from Spotify or something like that, um, but actually selectively extract, say, the, the one or two fields that might be relevant from credential A, uh, extract the one or two fields that are relevant from credential B, and combine those into a single presentation to prove just what's needed for the particular transaction that you're trying to have. Um, that's something that's that's unique to being able to do this digitally that you, you really can't do online unless you sort of go through and black out the details that you uh, that you don't want to share in a, in a, in a paper transaction. Um, that segues into uh, privacy, which I think was the, the fourth one we got to. Um, people talk a lot about privacy. And, and again, privacy is a, is a continuum um, and, and not just using this technology doesn't magically give you privacy. But deployed in the right way, you have the ability to have a few different types of privacy. One is selective disclosure. Um, so as I was talking about uh, in the previous example, being able to share only what's needed to have the, uh, the, the exchange that you need to have. Um, the other is that because it's a peer-to-peer -peer interaction that doesn't require a centralized intermediary, um, you don't have people who are spying on that transaction. Um, and in fact, if you're using a protocol like Didcom, for example, those uh, those exchanges are typically end-to-end -end encrypted anyway. So even if there was a relay uh, in, in the mix, they wouldn't be able to, to see what you're exchanging. Um, and then finally, there's uh, non-correlation. And so uh, some of the more sophisticated schemes um, allow you to use different identifiers for each of your relationships. And so what that means is um, if I'm if I'm sharing uh, some attributes or, or even a zero knowledge proof derived from, from credential A over here with, with party B, um, there's literally nothing about that transaction that could be used to uh, link me if those two uh, parties decided to collude behind my back and kind of compare notes and, and see if they, they knew which James I was. Um, and again, in some cases, you need to be strongly identified in that. That isn't relevant. Um, but in many cases where you're just proving that you're eligible for a product or service, people don't need to know exactly who you are. They just need to know that you meet the right criteria. And so embedding these types of privacy capabilities at the outset um, is, is a really powerful enabler. Um, control is, uh, it is the thing that is closest to, I think, the, the, the real pillar of self-sovereignty here. Um, that speaks to the fact that because you are sharing this information peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, um, the user is always giving explicit consent for what information is getting, getting released. So they, most of the interactions you see there, they're given a list of the fields that are being uh, requested. They can explicitly approve to share them. And that data goes from their wallet directly, not from some third party service that's doing it on their behalf. And so uh, it's just a more dignified way of doing things where you don't have that creepy sense that information is being shared behind your back. Um, that also gives you the security benefit um, that I alluded to um, because that data is uh, instead of every individual's data being stored in one giant database that's a very juicy uh, target for hackers. Um, instead, it's spread across the hundreds, thousands, or millions of, of individuals that use the service. 
um, that's a much different uh, attack surface for someone who might look to compromise that. They they could still go after you with a with a hammer and, and get your data specifically, but it's much harder for them to go and, and get a hundred million people's data in one go. Um, and then the final benefit is uh, is interoperability, and you know it's fair to say that at the moment the industry is in a state of uh, of quite imperfect interoperability. There's a number of different competing uh, protocols and, and kind of ecosystems out there, but the shared goal that, that they all have actually is that to manifest these benefits of, of portability and composability, all these different systems should work together. And so there's a strong belief in, in open standards and open source implementations that really mean that um, you don't have vendor lock-in. You can actually um, have, have big companies and little startups, open source projects, big government entities, uh, everything all working together so that we can actually remake the identity fabric of the internet. And so so those are the, the sort of seven key themes that, that I tend to key on when, when discussing these benefits. But um, you know, as, as I mentioned, uh, they don't all manifest in every use case. And it's very important to really focus on which one or two benefits actually matter um, and not get too hung up over the fact that, you know, maybe maybe in this one use case, control isn't important because guess what? You're, it's an employee use case. Um, the employer is going to require you to either share this data or not have a job. You know, that, that those sorts of scenarios exist, um, but you may still be delivering massive benefits when it comes to portability, authenticity and, and privacy, for example. So, you know, just just have have the use case in mind and then then look for which of those benefits um, can really be manifested. And that that'll tell you if it's a good candidate for a, for a decentralized or self-sovereign approach. Yeah, really well, really detailed and really well broken down, James. So, so thanks for that. Um, I don't know how you keep all of that in your head. Um, I think as well, one thing it highlights for me as well is like when you first start talking to, you know, with someone about identity, quite often they think you have one. Um, and like what your um, uh, descriptions there highlighted is we all have multiple identifiers that we use for lots of different use cases, whether it be accessing a website, a service or um, you know, it can also be a real world identity. It could be a driver's license or, you know, some kind of um, uh, travel pass or something like that. But I think it's important to point out that when we say identity, it, it can be many different things. And I think your, your description there um, really highlights that well. I think it's so important, Nick. So just, just to really riff on that, because, because you know, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and the way, um, the way a lot of, frankly, a lot of vendors in the space even talk about it, that, you know, it's your one identity. I mean, there's, there's probably three or four companies called one identity out there. Um, and, and I just think that's, I just think that's really unhealthy. Like we, we can express ourselves most fully when we're able to, um, to, to present those things which are relevant to the particular community or the particular interaction that we're, that we're trying to have. And so, you know, just like in my, in my bio, you generously referenced my, uh, my, my education background, my work history, my, some of my hobbies. You know, those are those are all different aspects of of my life, and you know, if if that was all wrapped up in in one identity, that would actually limit its usefulness. Whereas, um, you know, I've got a filing cabinet full of various different bits of paper that that document all those different uh, accomplishments and, and and kind of allow me to prove what I've done. Um, and you know, they they exist in a filing cabinet in my house, and I can go and get those and use those when I need to. What we're trying to build here is the digital equivalent of that, and it's the exact opposite of you know I've got I've got one wallet addressed on on a blockchain somewhere, and with it you get every protocol I've ever interacted with, my entire like list of tokens and financial transactions, all, all this other stuff, right? It's it's the opposite of that, and so you know the the, the Web three identity community I think is 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 waking up to this this difference, um, and I think it's going to be going to be really interesting to see. Some of those projects making progress in that direction. Yeah, very much so. So moving into the kind of main body, I think that um, I have seen you write somewhere that government issue credentials and the infrastructure for citizens to hold them and entities to accept them is a critical piece of national infrastructure. I think this is kind of in relation to um, obviously the EU making plans to um, launch a digital identity wallet and obviously kind of regulate um member states to enable the, their citizens to have access to, to a wallet. Um, why do you think it is so critical, James? Well, I mean, think about the hundreds of microaggressions that you experience in your daily life because of how hard it is to 
to basically get on with your business because you're needing to, to, to prove who you are. Um, or prove something about yourself and then multiply that out across the entire population of a country. And then imagine it being 10 times worse for people who are less digitally included than, than you or I might be. Um, that, that just gives you a sense of the scope of the problem. So it's easy to key in on things like, oh, there's so much fraud. And if we had verifiable credentials, we could eliminate the fraud. But, you know, that, frankly, that speaks to, to people who already have, you know, quite a lot. And we're just, just looking for efficiencies there. You know, I, I like to reference the, there's a McKinsey study, I think it was from 2019, that um, looked at a number of different economies and, and found that, you know, a, a fully integrated digital identity um, scheme could uh, unlock GDP growth of between, uh, between six and 13% um, across this, this range of nations. Um, and just think what think what that would mean. Like even if we weren't currently living through you know hyperinflation and currency crises and things like that, um, that that speaks to how much potential is is kept at bay by how uh, how egregious these systems are today. And so, so I think every country, every every nation that is trying to do the best by its citizens would look at a enabling that growth and and b frankly just just doing away with the indignity of of the way we have to do these things today. So. It's important to do it carefully. Um, it's important to do it inclusively. And I think it can't be left entirely to the, the private sector because while that is where innovation comes from, and I, and I, I certainly think it would be a mistake to exclude uh, private sector from, from these transactions, um, it, the incentives are not, are not always right there. You know, look at our, you know, our, our news media infrastructure and our, our social communication infrastructure is, is mostly privatized there. And that's led to all kinds of outcomes that, that we didn't expect. And so, so we don't want that uh, for our, our identity infrastructure. Um, and that's, uh, that's especially important in a time where it's getting increasingly harder and harder to tell what's, what's authentic and what isn't. So, so for all those reasons, I think it's absolutely critical that, that governments take a, forward-looking approach to this and recognize that, you know, while they may think they have a, you know, a um, financial services, like a financial crime crisis, or they may they think they have an, an unemployment crisis, all this kind of things, underpinning a lot of that is difficulties telling the good guys from the bad guys, proving that you're eligible for a loan, proving that you've got the right training to go get a job and, and so on and so forth. And that potential for growth, I think, is why this should be a top priority across the whole world. And, and the EU is, as you said, um, really leading the charge there. And it's something I think to be admired. Definitely. I think there's also a misconception that like technology can somehow narrow the gap between people that have like all these services already in place and, and the rich and the poor. And the reality seems to be that quite often new technology makes that gap even bigger. So I think it's for that reason as well, it's really important that, that governments get involved to make sure that this is not yet another thing where um, those in developing countries get left behind uh, because uh, clearly it's not going to make uh, life any better for them either. That's, that's very true. Very true. So I think we're in a place where we think soon each person will have a digital identity wallet in their phone if they don't already. Um, and it can verify data about themselves um, that they can present to um, people uh, or entities looking for, for verification of something of their identity. Um, what do you think it means for those individuals and also the businesses that uh, could be uh, online services, for example, that they are interacting with? You know, I think mostly good stuff. I mean, there are there are certainly some risks that this introduces, and, and I, I want to make sure we we cover those off um, before we're done speaking. But you know, in, in terms of what it'll mean, you know, I, I think it will mean easier, faster, and more dignified interactions. And and the reason I say dignified is because you know you can have easier, faster interactions uh, today if you're willing to sort of fully share all your information. Um, and we, I, I don't think it's healthy to, to live in a, in a world like that. Um, you know, I, I think people should, should only have to share what's, what's actually genuinely required. And, you know, we have, you know, we have here in, in the UK and in the EU and other places, pretty good privacy regulations that, that sort of try to place the burden on, on organizations to only collect what's, what's needed. But because of the risk of of fraud and, and financial crime and so forth, the definition of what's needed is, is quite high because you, you need to collect a lot in order to, to cross-reference it and, uh, and, and make sure that it's legit. Um, if we can move to a world where actually the data can be verified as gen being genuinely authentic and genuinely belonging to the, to the individual, then you should need to see less of it to be able to reach the same level of trust. And 
you should need to keep it for less time um, because uh, all it's going to represent to you once you've onboarded that person is an ongoing liability. And so I really think that for a lot of interactions, we'll be able to have a greater degree of, uh, of, of, of frictionless um, onboarding and also personalization, which doesn't necessarily come from sharing more data. It comes from making that sharing much easier and uh, sort of much more equitable. So that that will be, I think, delightful for all of us. And anyone who's used, you know, Apple Pay when checking out online for, the, for that first time you use it and you just get to get to pay in one click and your shipping address is filled in for you and stuff like that, that's, that's quite magical. Um, you know, imagine that for any time you see a form or a login or a, or a sign up button, that's that's really the, the, the kind of place where we're going to. So, I think that will that will save people a huge amount of time and, and money and, and frustration. Um, but I think it goes further than that. You know, once once those wallets can um, can you know, represent not just your identity according to the government or these big internet companies or the retailers you use, but once it can, you know, like, like we referenced earlier, know about your musical tastes and your, your hobbies and, you know, really have a grasp on, on all the different aspects of your life. Um, I think if you combine that with, uh, with, with personal AI and things like that, you can end up with, you know, very empowered autonomous agents that sort of are, are genuinely working on your behalf. And so, you know, these interactions don't just become easier. In many cases, I think they, they disappear entirely. Um, and you, you can just have a, uh, you know, a much richer and and more fulfilling uh, life, which I think will be will be hugely promising. Yeah. Um, but you know, all of that sounds great. You know, the, the the risk, obviously, if we make it very very easy to share like verifiable information about exactly who you are, is that you know there will be companies that will want to collect that, and because it's so easy, uh, you, know, you could e you could end up in a world where people are oversharing all the time and and find themselves you know, more identified than they need to be. Um, and so I think it's very important that as we build these technologies and as we light up these use cases and we all get very excited, you know, the the sort of governance angle and the and the regulations, frankly, keep up with that and, and, and make it clear that sort of just because you can share this information uh, doesn't mean you always should. Um, because the true promise here is not just sharing the information, but sharing um, uh, zero knowledge proofs and insights about the information that mean that you can still trust me without needing to know exactly who I am. And I think if we can, if we can get that right, then, uh, then it'll be a really great future. Yeah. I think that's is why we see it as so important as well. When like there's obviously other forms of identity, I think that's why the decentralized or SSI uh, self-sovereign identity people are so evangelical almost about this technology because we realize how pervasive all of this is going to be and if that were to all be centralized what a disaster it would be um as well like if you're now filling out all these forms and, and things and that's all being done for you by a centralized commercial entity um that would be absolutely disastrous and i think that mm. you know we've seen this a lot with the internet generally when like is one thing to educate individuals about how much information they're sharing and we should continue to do that. Um, but the reality is people are quite lazy by their nature. And so yeah. quite often they'll take the more convenient path rather than the one that's maybe a bit more involved. Um, even if it requires, you know, even if the end result was they become more private online. So I think a big aspect of yeah. course, is making it all the SSI technology at least as easy to use as the centralized solutions are. So looking at something like yeah. Apple, you know, making SSI that easy to use, that makes it, you know, a, a straight swap for an individual to, to pick up and use an SSI wallet over using uh, something that, yeah. for example, Apple have, have produced. A hundred percent, but but that that is going to require some trade-offs, right? Like there's, there's, there is a degree of dogma in uh, in some areas of the sort of the wider SSI community, who uh, you know, where where people I think rightly bristle at the amount of control that Apple has as a result of offering that magical, very convenient experience, and you know, we I think we would like a world where um, things are as convenient as app, as Apple makes them, but you don't have to rely on their benign dictatorship. There's a there's a plurality of vendors that sort of all hold themselves to a high standard, and they they compete to make it a wonderful experience. Um, yeah, Apple if, would say in an antitrust hearing, of course, that that is what they're doing. Um, and, you know, they, they don't do a, they don't do a terrible job, at least when it comes to the identity stuff. But, um, but yeah, you know, we, if we want to make it that good, um, we can't 
have people needing to download umpteen different wallet apps and we can't have them write down seed phrases for recovery um, we can't make them scan QR codes when they're used to clicking, clicking on links. Um, we can't have like three separate confirmation screens when when actually we're trying to make, you know, we're trying to remove obstacles, not introduce new ones. So, you know, expecting a big change in consumer behavior is is not going to work. And expecting people to adopt this just because of privacy um, is, is not going to work either. Privacy is absolutely one of the most important benefits. But, um, you know, study after study shows that, yeah, people say they care about it, but they don't take action because of it. And so it's incumbent on us who are building solutions in this space to, to you know, make, as you said, something that is, you know, at least as good in all the conventional ways as what it's trying to replace. And then uniquely better in one or two ways, specifically because it's, it's decentralized or self-sovereign. Like that's the magical recipe. Um, but it does require trade-offs between you know, how much control, how much centralization, how much interoperability you're willing to tolerate in the early stages. Like, I think, I think we'll get to that world where everything is interoperable um, eventually, but the, the way to get there is not just this low and lowest common denominator way. I think you have to make things that are useful end to end to show that people should care because otherwise the, the, the big tech vendors and the centralized players will, will just do an end run around the whole thing. Yeah, definitely. And I think, like, as we're talking through this stuff, James, I think what's becoming clear is if we're using these, if we're having these different um, decentralized identifiers, you know, we obviously, you know, need a place to put them. And we've talked about the kind of EU um, through yeah, IDAS bringing out um, kind of regulation around wallets. So where do you put all of this stuff when you have it? And so the kind of self-sovereign idea or at least decentralized idea would be that it goes on an individual's edge device like a phone and one where they would completely control the keys and the access to that and wallet and they can entirely control um, you know, access to that wallet by any third party. Um, and so if we think about how this could be expanded to more and more identifiers going into these wallets, you know, even if you think about things like um, uh, you know, things like credentials being used to replace passwords and things of that nature, uh, we get the the you know you, you could start to draw a conclusion of, of we're gonna have a lot of stuff in these wallets. Um, and so you could get to uh, a notion that the wallets will be the kind of new competitive battleground. Would you agree with that statement? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, and and I, and I think it's um, I think it's unfortunate because you know long term I don't expect consumers to care very much about their wallet. Um, you know, I I use Apple Pay uh, very often. I hardly ever open the the wallet app on my uh, on my iPhone for it. Right, it shows up in context. Um, I can quickly consummate the transaction I'm trying to do and then it, then it disappears. And my primary focus is on the merchant or, or whatever it was I was actually having that interaction with. And, you know, that's, that's how this stuff needs to work uh, long term. And so, you know, the fact that sort of now uh, there are uh, a massive range of, of wallet apps out there that have different takes on what the user experience should be. They're aligned to different uh, different communities. Uh, some of them are quite blockchain specific. Some are you know, sort of closely aligned with, with Web3 and things like that. You know, others, um, you know, others are built for specific use cases or, or ecosystems. Um, I think that's just kind of the, the messy middle of, of this phase where um, to make something work end to end, uh, unfortunately at the moment, you know, you need to control many of the pieces along the pipeline because we don't yet live in a world where um, all the relevant issuers are, uh, are are issuing standards compliant credentials in in formats that you can use. Consumers have wallets on the device that that play nicely with those, and relying parties have have the infrastructure to accept them. And so, if you're trying to build an application that works today, you know, quite often you have to plumb a lot of that in yourself, um, and the wallet. Is, is one of the most critical pieces of that because it's the bit that the user sees and touches. And it's also where that that promise of trust, that the binding of those credentials to that individual and the end-to-end -end encryption, it's the kind of fulcrum for that. And so for all those reasons, most of the successful projects today um, have either shipped their own wallet or have, have aligned behind sort of one or two that are, um, that, that, that are quite well known. Um, you know, sketching this out though, it was a bit like that with uh, with internet access in the early days, right? The, everybody knew that eventually this open network was going to allow uh, access to all the world's information. It was going to be amazing. Um, 
But in the beginning, how did you get connected? How did you find the relevant stuff? How did you know it would it would just work? You know, you had CompuServe, AOL, you had a bunch of people that offered, you know, a, uh, yes, it was based on internet protocols, but it was, you know, a little bit sandboxed and, and that the, the interaction was very wallet specific. And then you had in the next era, an explosion of browser vendors because the browser was the new battleground. And that was where, you know, because it was the, the, the bit of Chrome that the user actually touched and interacted with, um, that was where you could actually exert a lot of, a lot of market power. And so, you know, obviously famously there was, there was Netscape and then internet explorer, came along and, and Microsoft used their distribution advantage to, to, to commoditize that market. Um, and today, yeah, people do care a little bit about their browser, but the vast majority of people use the one that's bundled with their device because they're all standards compliant. They all use the same protocols under the hood and they all, they all just work. Um, and so I think we'll follow a similar adoption curve, honestly, where you know we'll have this compusive era that we're in now and to make it work, you've got to sort of have some wall gardens. Um, I think you'll move into a phase where um, it will make sense to ship like really good wallets, and there'll be there'll be revenues you can get there from uh, you know from uh, maybe fees that are that are paid for for these transactions, or maybe advertising, maybe recommendations, things like that. So you know, once people recognise they need wallets to deliver these services, being a, a vendor of a really good wallet will be a sensible proposition, and being a brand that that wants to be associated with that will make sense. So I think we'll see popular consumer brands and I think we'll see financial institutions and other brands that are associated with trust making a play to be that that icon on the home screen um, but I think the the end game is is more likely to be you know you'll have your uh, your standards compliant government issued wallet like like you might get from the EU uh, and or your uh, your OEM ships one just like they ship you a browser and you know fortunately you don't have to care about it because all those magical experiences will will just work because they're enabled by the the right kind of protocols. Um, that's that's what I expect to happen, but you know it is not a given because you know not all of the vendors that are in a position to uh, to, to do this this bundling are aligned with the wider community in terms of which protocols uh, manifest the right combination of benefits, like we talked about earlier. So um, you know we could end up in a scenario where we don't get the degree of of you know independence or privacy or that that, that we would like, um, but but nonetheless that's that's how I expect the the wallet wars to unfold and it's going to be fascinating to watch it happen. Yeah, and likely like you said, like distribution will likely win out. Like nobody wants multiple different wallet apps uh, that might happen like that. Like you said at the start, but ultimately people you know, want one thing to worry about. So. I think like distribution is likely to be key uh, as well. And yeah, I think yeah. the market will also consolidate. So apps will fall away that are maybe specific to one network or really have not really gotten any traction. Um, and also you probably see a lot of wallets buying other wallets potentially uh, and buying yeah. up user base. And hopefully none of that will matter to the individual because, <laughs> the, because it's self-sovereign, right? So because their keys and their credentials are based on open standards and they happen to live in that wallet for now, you know, if, if that wallet goes away and new one comes along, like that should be fine. Um, it, it probably won't be because as we know that the interoperability today is quite brittle, but you know, we're, we're on a, we're on a good path there, I think. And, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, there's, there's, there's not that many people who have self-sovereign identities today. So we're not going to inconvenience many people in this, this messy middle. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Uh, James, at the start, you talked about the kind of, we talked about the benefits of SSI and you made the point, I think rightly so that, um, you know, it's horses for courses. There, there are certain um, benefits, but it depends on the use case. Um, what are the most interesting, um, maybe give me just one or two interesting SSI use cases that you've come across, maybe ideally kind of citing some that are in production uh, because we, we always love things that are actually being used by people. Yeah, gosh, I mean, there's 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 quite a few um, that are, and I'm, I'm trying to um, I'm trying to make sure I don't just always trot out the the same examples um, because uh, so there's there's less in production than we would like, but there's more than people think, uh, and you know so the, the the one the one I always I always used to talk about a lot uh, uh, when I was at Evernim because it was it was one of my absolute favourite use cases was a was a doctor's passport that um, that basically allowed workers in our national health service to move from uh, from one hospital to the other without having to spend uh, a day uh, beforehand, basically in, in some HR office in the basement with their original degree certificate and their passport and their uh, GMC registration, all this other stuff to, to prove that they were a real doctor so they could go and go and help patients. You know, that, 
I, I love that use case because it's it's canonical portable identity. I mean, you know, it, it is exactly uh, made for this technology. And you know, while you think of the NHS as a monolith, it's not. It's it's a thousand plus different trusts, um, but they all have this same root of trust. They they all are willing to, to broadly trust each other's work. Um, so you need an inherently decentralized solution to make that work. Um, and you know the the scale of the human impact there was was massive because a hundred thousand clinical days a year were wasted just with this manual paper vetting process. Um, and you know think about the benefit that that could have been brought to patients if if the the health workers were able to actually um, spend that time not doing clerical duties, but but um, but actually working with with staff. So so I, I, I love that use case, but I feel like I talk about it all the time. So. Um, so a couple of others that use case you just talked about. I'm not going to talk about the use case that I just got. Or I'm not going to not going to monologue about the use case. No. So um, a, a couple, uh, I guess, a couple that I've sort of been involved in in the last the last six months that I think are really cool. Um, one is uh, is a reusable business identity uh, platform, and so you know we we talk a lot about the benefits that self sovereign has uh, self sovereign identity has for individuals, and I think it's it's a cause very close to my heart, and I, and I think yours as well, Nick. But um, you know the the fact is that. All these same uh, processes are actually, they multiply tenfold when you're a business. The amount of stuff you have to prove about yourself to be approved as a supplier to, say, a pharmaceutical company or to be onboarded for a, a business bank account or to get a loan or to receive investment, um, it's its very, very onerous. And uh, the process is, is utterly non-standard. Even though the, the uh, level of compliance you have to reach is typically standard across the industry. Um, the specific process you go through isn't. And, you know, these things, people are emailing back and forth, like spreadsheets as, as forms. And, and, you know, it's, it's 2023. I mean, that, that, is, that is ridiculous. So some human being is wasting time typing in data. Another human being is wasting time reviewing that and plugging it into a variety of third-party tools to get it verified and, and so on and so forth. And that is repeated every single time you need to conduct, uh, ha have due diligence conducted on yourself. And so applying these same principles of uh, instantly verifiable data, uh, placing it under the entity's control um, and making it portable um, between these, these different contexts, you know, can allow you to cut through all the inefficiency in those processes and, you know, get, get onboarded, get your data verified once, but then for every subsequent process, you can still reuse that, that core of verifiable data that, uh, that was built up there. So, so I love that use case just for its, its ability to, again, you know, have massive commercial impact, but also for the individuals involved, like they're going to get to focus on growing their business and doing more productive things and just cranking through paperwork. Um, so, so that, that's a use case very dear to my heart. Um, and uh, another one that's, that's sort of quite quite timely, because here in the UK, uh, you know, we just had the the King's coronation, and, and a big part of that was a a push uh, for everyone in the UK to get involved in uh, in volunteering. They, they called it the Big Help Out. Um, and you know, there's a there's a company I'm I'm working with that is building a uh, essentially a portable volunteer profile, or you, you might you might call it a volunteer passport. But it's um, it's something that can help uh, charities and other organisations. Um, onboard uh, people to act as uh, act as volunteers for them, um, and be able to to rely and, and reuse the the verification of that person's uh, work history, employment, unemployment, uh, training they've received, background checks, so on and so forth. Um, that, that has been done by the by the wider community. So again, more of the money that uh, that they raise can actually go to helping the the cause that they're aligned to, rather than um, you're paying for repetitive processes that again just just get between that individual and actually delivering impact. And so, what what I like about sort of these three examples, you know, there's there's one that's professional, there's one that's business, there's one that's kind of individual and and, and kind of volunteer sector, is that you know. You can you can turn over a rock anywhere and and find a, a place where identity is being done badly, and you could you could just apply some subset of those benefits that we talked about earlier and and make it better using some of these technologies. And so, um, it's yeah, it's incredibly exciting. But those are those are just a couple of examples, Nick. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, really good. And and the NHS one's fantastic as well. I have heard it before, but I definitely think it's worth repeating that because not everyone that's listening will have heard of that. So. And great to know it's been, I think NHS is maybe still the largest employer in the world, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, it's certainly a great use case. Um, yeah, I, I think they're maybe the fifth largest, it's 1.3 million staff basically, so right. they're, they're a very large concern. Um, and yeah, this this thing is live in, I think it's over 130 uh, trusts, I, I mean, I, to be honest, I, I forget what the count is, but there's a, there's a webpage, you know, because, because it's a, a public body, uh, all this data is public, so... 
um, you, you can go and look it up. But um, yes, it's live in you know well over a hundred uh, hospitals. There's, there's doctors using it you know, literally day in day out, um, and so it's nice to think that that's actually having a, yeah, having a positive impact. Yeah, great yeah. that you're involved in that as well. So somebody then who's like um, had all this experience advising doc, like I said, and there's other companies you mentioned the charity work that you're doing as well. Um, no one seems to be to me at least to be better placed to advise or give practical tips to organizations looking to implement SSI. I know that's a very broad thing, but could you give us some kind of maybe some broad examples of, of what organizations that are seeking to leverage this technology might consider? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. And I, I, I'll start by saying, uh, it's, it's very kind of you to say that, but I'll start by saying what I, what I say to everyone who I work with, which is that you know I've, I've also made many of the mistakes that I want to help people avoid. So I, I, know, I know where the bodies are buried. So it's not, it's not just about best practice. Um, I, I certainly haven't got everything right. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, look, you know, the, the the single most important thing, and and maybe I'm maybe I'm biased because of my background, but um, the single most important thing is that you know basic product management doesn't go out the window just because there's a blockchain or, or verifiable credentials or some like fancy new technology involved. You know you you still need to start with a clear understanding of what the user problem is, and you need to be aware of which benefits matter in your use case and. And which ones don't? You know, don't don't try and force fit a solution where it doesn't it doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, and you know, with with those things in mind, you can uh, architect a solution that can actually deliver um, deliver on the benefits that you want. But if you over index on uh, you know on the decentralization aspect, for example, when you're you're working in a in a, in a bounded kind of closed context. Then um, you're going to end up with with outcomes that that, that don't make sense. Um, and I see a lot of companies that sort of want to really manifest all the goodness that decentralized identity could bring to a user, um, and in doing so, they water down their opportunity to to really bring the the one key benefit that actually mattered in a particular use case. So I've I've hammered on about it in this conversation, and I, I did a whole SSI meetup webinar that where I, I was harping on about this as well. But it's it's kind of my crusade at the moment is, is really to, to say like, we don't, we don't have to do all the things. Like I, I think we, we really can focus on, uh, on designing something that is, is, is likely to deliver the most important uh, areas of benefit. Um, the second thing is, and you mentioned it earlier, Nick, that um, distribution is, is everything. And so, you know, it, it is not enough to just build a better mousetrap. Uh, you know, it, it's been said many times that, that great distribution um, of, a, of a terrible product will often beat uh, a poor distribution of a really, really great product. And you know, obviously no one, no one here is trying to build a terrible product, but the fact is that if you don't have a clear route to market and in, in a decentralized environment, that often means an ability to corral multiple stakeholders and align their incentives and sort of make sure that, that actually everybody is invested in, in the same outcome here. Um, then you're going to build something that's that's really cool, and it's going to sit gathering dust on the shelf. And, and I think that's that's a great shame um, because you know most most people who are working with this stuff like, really do want to make a difference. And so um, don't don't get to distribution last. You know, just just like make sure that that's that's a key part of the um, of the solutioneering uh, right from the right from the beginning. I like I liked what you said as well. I think some um, organisations think that. You made the point that like good product management is is still good product management. It doesn't necessarily matter too much about the range of tools, and, and it's definitely something that you can kind of see it maybe sometimes at conferences where people fall in love with the technology, uh, but lose track of who's going to use it, how are they going to use it, how are we going to get it to them, and all these types of things. So I think you've learned that by by your own practical experience. And I did like your oh. comment, but I know where the bo- the bodies are buried. I thought that was good. No, look, very, very much so, and you know, I, I'm I'm incredibly proud of of what what we achieved at Everton. Um, there are definitely some things that you know, obviously, with with hindsight, might have done differently. But you know, we uh, we had a clear vision for what what we wanted to do, what we wanted to achieve in the world, um, and we had a set of very strong principles that that we weren't willing to to compromise on. And you know that. That led to some that led to, to some decisions that sort of really really affected the product direction. And you know, I I don't regret it because I I actually I think that by taking such a firm stand and by by being you know relatively early in the space, I think we're able to shift the conversation in a direction that that's been helpful. Um, but there's no question in my mind that we we could have been more 
commercially successful if if we'd compromise on some of those points. Um, and so, you know, it is it is good that you know for for people starting today, they don't need to do what you know what what Evanim did or, or even what what Doc has done, which is to build basically the whole stack. You know, the, the great thing is there's there's a number of vendors. There's you know there's, there's not just Doc. There's there's dozens um, who. Uh, have you know a really good set of primitives that you can that you can use. You know, there's there's hundreds of DID methods of which only a only a couple dozen are really relevant. But you know, you've got you've got DIDs, you've got verifiable credential flavors, you've got protocols that you can use, you've got wallet vendors, you've got SDKs, you've got SaaS platforms, and increasingly you've got workflow tools, integrations, distribution marketplaces, nice UIs. Like there's there's a lot there now, and so you don't need to reinvent the wheel, right? It is very exciting to be working with cryptography and blockchains and zero-knowledge proofs and all that stuff. And that, you know, the, a lot of people who get into the space uh, will, will know like, that the same feeling I had when I was first reading about this stuff. It is intellectually thrilling. Like, it's really, really cool. Um, but none of that matters to the user. And if we if we persist on showing our working, right, like, you know, making, making recovery phrases, QR codes, all this shenanigans, like a, a part of the product, you know, I, I think we've got a real problem. And that doesn't mean we paper over it and weld everything together and make it so that there's no interoperability, no user choice. You know, the, the balance is, is difficult to get right. Um, but, you know, a lot of that can be dealt with down the line um, as long as you've made a useful product. Whereas if you never make a useful product, you don't get the luxury of making any of those trade-offs, right? You, you never actually get to the point where your interoperability or lack thereof matters because no one's using it. And so this this trade off here is is like profoundly important. Um, and and you know the good news is I think I think more and more teams are, are are waking up to that. Yeah, no, very good point. Yeah, you're here, and I know that you're helping us with that as well. So I think we're almost out of time, James. The time has absolutely flown past. Um, but I, I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to mention that you uh, wanted people to hear before we wrap up. I, I mean, I, only a only a call to action really, which is that you know I, I think it's going to take. Uh, it's going to take an army to push this rock up the hill, and I think the stakes are, are really, really high. Right? If if we if we don't get there quick enough, then the good enough solutions that are are being proposed and are, are being actively marketed um, will will likely achieve dominance. And you know that may feel just as convenient and just as just as easy uh, as. Uh, as, as, as we might envisage a, a self-sovereign world to be, but it won't be as private. It won't be as dignified. And at the end of the day, that I think will lead to less freedom and less serendipity, um, which you know are some of the things that, that make life so exciting. So I, I think it's I think it's really important um, to, to get this work right. Um, I think we haven't yet seen the, the first sort of you know really generational identity company built. There's there's some massive ones out there like Okta and things like that, but. But you know, really, um, identity is still adjacent to to many other industries, and so I think there's everything to play for in terms of the the commercial opportunity for getting this right. Um, and you know, if if we really want a world where I can take my uh, I can take my driver's license and use it for a bank account, I can take my banking reputation, use it to go and get credit. I can take my credit, use it to buy a car. I can use my the fact that I've always driven Audis to go and get a discount on a rental, blah, blah, blah. If, if I want to be able to like move all that, then we need hundreds of use cases. So, you know, we, we don't just need infrastructure companies. We need people building on top of companies that, that provide that and, and going after the industries that they know really well, where they have an unfair distribution advantage. And that is what's going to lead to this thing, uh, this thing really taking off. I don't believe self-sovereign identity is something you can give someone. I don't think it's, and then it's something that you can create even. I think it is an emergent property of a bunch of these services that reach sufficient scale that they bump into each other and that interoperability naturally happens. And so we just need hundreds of them out there um, based with, with interoperability at the core based on these same standards. And so uh, I, I just urge people to get involved there. I, I couldn't imagine a more thrilling uh, industry to, to be spending my career in. And um, yeah, it's been really great to chat about it, Nick. So thanks so much. Oh, my pleasure. And like you say, the stakes have never been higher. It's so pervasive that, uh, yeah, it's important that all of us in the industry continue to um, to fight the good fight and uh, try and bring others with us. So, but thank you very much for your time, James. It's been really insightful. My pleasure. <laughs>